Hi, I'm Dr. Garth Fisher, a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon. You're listening to Interview with a Surgeon with a Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with a Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Garth Fisher, one of the most widely known plastic surgeons in the U.S. Dr. Fisher is a plastic surgeon who originated the television series Extreme Makeover, which was an instantaneous phenomenon ABC hit series. This international television experience, coupled with his unprecedented vision to utilize the media as a vehicle to bring plastic surgery information into the public domain, has accelerated and expanded patient access to plastic surgery on a worldwide scale. His practice includes A-list celebrities, entertainment and fashion icons, supermodels, Fortune 500 business executives, royalty, and other medical and licensed professionals from around the world. Los Angeles Magazine named him one of the best plastic surgeons in Los Angeles, and Town & Country Magazine also listed Dr. Fisher as one of the best doctors for facelift procedures in the United States. In 2014, Dr. Sir Garth Fisher was knighted in honor of his long-standing contribution and achievement in the field of plastic surgery. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome celebrity plastic surgeon Dr. Garth Fisher. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. So let's Thank just you. jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Uh, my goals are the same as they are today. I want to do the best job I can at all times. I want to be the best surgeon I can at all times. I want to have the best results. I, I uh, don't want to look in front of me and see anybody in front of me. I want to look behind and see the crowd. I just, you know, in every way, I just want to improve my skills and be the best technical surgeon, best doctor for my patient I possibly can and the best father. Now you did a fellowship. Can you kind of take us through that fellowship year and what your mentality was like, you know, going into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Yeah. Well, the first five years, you know, I did an internship and four years of general surgery residency, which was a great, great training, uh, you know, being able to do aortic aneurysms and everything else. I mean, it was just fantastic training. Uh, and then I went into two years of plastic surgery at University of California, Irvine. And uh, I was really lucky. I, I, you know, I'd done trauma, congenital stuff. I've done, you know, everything at that point. But I really wanted to do the aesthetic uh, things like uh, breast reconstruction, breasts, noses, facelifts, and things like that. So, um, you know, I was very lucky down in Southern California to have so many aesthetic cases. I mean, I, I just did so many. And when I got out, my, uh, my, my, uh, you know, the head of my department, he said, "You don't need to, you don't need to do a fellowship." I, you know, and I thought, "No, I want to be the best I can." So. I trained with Bruce Cannell. Uh, he was, I thought, the best face of surgeon ever lived. Um, I did an aesthetic fellowship with him for faces, eyes, and those kind of things. And then went to Japan, trained there a little while. I just wanted to hit the streets, uh, very knowledgeable and, and you know, being the best I could be. So it was, I was always driven in that way. And when I got out, um, I, I got interviews with several surgeons uh, in Los Angeles, one of which was, uh, you know, at that time had a very premier practice. And um, I won my interview because he asked me to close this brow lift incision, which I'd learned from Dr. Cannell right along the hairline. And, you know, he said, oh, my God, I've never seen an incision close like that. You're hired. And so he hired me in that regard. And that, that kind of dovetails into what happened. Well, I, I think I was very fortunate and I was trained very well. And then I also continued to have mentors that I learned and just, you know, sucked up information from. I took the notes. And, you know, unfortunately, and I'm not, a, I'm not an arrogant person at all, but I am good with my hands. And, and you know, look, I'm bad, bad at other things. I can't do a lot of things, but I'm very good with my hands. And it's unfortunate in, in plastic surgery, you know, you can learn, you can be smart, but if you're not good with your hands, it's just it's probably not going to work for you. And you're going to have to continue marketing and things like that. And, you know, and, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. You know, if you, as a sports agent, I know if you can't get on base, you're probably not going to get on a team, you know, you, you got to be able to hit the ball. So, so, so I learned everything I could to be better and better and better. And I, I think uh, in the early part of my practice, I really outworked everybody. I handed out three, 400 business cards a week. Uh, you know, I didn't care if it was a maitre d', it was the janitor, it was the ballet guy, you know, with the same line, hey, I'm Dr. Fisher, you know, if somebody looks for me, this is where I am, I'll be sitting down there having a steak. And, you know, they just, they, I got to know everybody. And, you know, then you, you, I remember, I remember, you know, early in my practice, you know, I got referred this guy uh, that had a, a keloid on front of his ear, you know, just the smallest little nothing. And I was like, well, I, do, I really want to do this, but ended up doing it and found out he was uh, like, he owned a major hotel in Las Vegas. He sent his wife, his daughter, and, you know, two other people. It's like, you never know what that branch is going to turn into. So you treat everybody with love and respect and do your best job. And, 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 you know, it sticks in their mind. They talk about it over the dinner, you know, table with other people. So I really worked hard and, and I, um, I, I got trained. I was in a good position. I, I went in with somebody who I think is a good idea for a younger guy. Uh, it's hard to start. It's hard to start by yourself. Um, and look, you know, I was like everybody else. I didn't know anything about business as well. And, you know, you learn through, you, you learn, you get B school in the next 15 years by, you know, getting trampled uh, out there in the world. So, 
Um, but that's that. But kind of with that mindset on the hustle behind when you first got started, you know, what were some of the keys of your success in that early part of your career that allowed you to climb to the top of the industry? Uh, you know, I think I, I just really had good results. Um, and I was good with my patients. Um, you know, I really had no marketing. I, I know when I got extreme makeover, when I got extreme makeover, I had a, I got a two year waiting list after that. Okay. But people don't know that before extreme makeover, I had a year waiting list. So it wasn't like, you know, I already was busy. This just helped me out. But, uh, and that was fantastic for my practice, obviously. Um, and, 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 you know, increased my international footprint, but, you know, I just, I just worked really, really hard. I, I, I spent a lot of time going out, talking to people, meeting people, restaurants, you know, uh, it was tough on my marriage and, you know, but I would do it the same way again, but. Kind of thinking back in those beginning years now and all the hustle that you went through for that, you know, what are some of the things that maybe you learned the hard way that looking back now, you would have given your younger self better advice? Well, you know, I was like, they say Buffalo in the middle of herd catch no arrow. And I was like the first Buffalo with extreme makeover. I was the first guy on reality TV show for a plastic surgery show. And I thought that was still done so professionally if you look back at that show. And it really opened, it, it increased the IQ, plastic surgery IQ across the country and brought it out of the mystery, you know, plastic surgery out of the mystery and actually increased the plastic surgery procedures by 30% uh, in the United States and cosmetic dentistry as well. And, you know, these societies got so damn jealous, they're trying to kick me out of the societies because uh, I was doing something unethical, being on a TV show. And, and really it was, you know, ABC was on my side because, you know, I was their golden boy at that point. And, you know, while they're trying to kick me out for being unethical, all the, you know, heads of the, you know, societies were trying to get on the show. And it was just kind of a circus. And I was like, are you kidding me? Really? And I think, I think you know, I could just resigned from all my societies. I thought it was just BS. And if I was a younger doctor, I'd say, you know what, just pay for your meetings. You don't have to get involved in all that stuff. It's just, you know, the money for that stuff is, well, where does it go? These people flying in private jets to meetings. You know, I, I, so I don't think membership is really important. Uh, you know, I've got, you know, probably 15 amazing attorneys. I don't know what members their societies are members of. I don't know, you know, I don't know. You know, so I just don't think that was that. There was such an emphasis placed on that. Uh, back in the beginning, you got to be in this society, you got to be in that society. It's like, it really has no, nothing to do with anything. Patients don't really care. Um, and that has to do with academics also. Listen, I respect everybody that's doing all those, all the research and writing papers and steering committees and stuff like that. But that's very boring to me. I'd never want to do any of that. I just want to operate on my patients and go home and be with my family and friends. So uh, it's just not my thing. Um, so I, I never, ever, ever wanted to be in academics. I was not, uh, not at all anything. I, I don't want to be controlled. I don't want to be supervised. I don't want to be told what to do. I, you know, I'm an ethical guy that's going to do the right thing every time. And, and, you know, I'm never on the shoulder of the road. So um, I don't need anybody steering me who might you know, be something different. I don't know if they are or not. It's just, it's not my interest at all. Now we're both here in Beverly Hills and everyone kind of refers to you as a celebrity plastic surgeon. You know, it took a lot of work for you to get there. I'm just curious as to, you know, what can you share to the graduating residents and fellows as far as, you know, those beginning years and getting to that point, you know, how did you get involved in certain circles or the certain things that you did to position yourself the best way possible? Yeah, you know, I, uh, one of the lucky things that happened, I'll tell you the lucky thing that happened around, uh, you know, the early mid nineties was, uh, you know, I did this girl's breasts and Hefner saw them and thought they were the best ones he ever saw. And he actually commented on that at me, to me and, and, uh, started sending every patient from the Playboy mansion. And that's, you know, I trained with facelifts with Bruce Cannell. That's all I want to do is facelifts. And, and, um, and then I, you know, I got referred every patient from the Playboy mansion. And it was just like an avalanche after that. So that was a very lucky strike. And, you know, I got to know those people and, and, um, uh, you know, in the social circles. And, and you know, I, I, I just started meeting patients and they referred their friends. I think you have to look at every potential interaction with anybody, you know, and it's nice to be authentic about it. But, you know, these are all people that can send you 5, 10, 20, 50 people and you have to leave a great impression. You got to do a good job. You have to treat everybody like they're your family member. I don't care how hard it is. You have to, and hopefully you're treating your family members well. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you just have to be a good person, keep your nose clean, stay out of the trouble. And, and just be a good doctor. I met a lot of, I, I met a lot of celebrities and, and uh, you know, just going out, meeting people, operating on people. Uh, you know, I've taken care of the White House to, uh, from the White House to the King of Saudi Arabia. You know, it's everybody. So Putin's people. What advice do you have for the graduating chief residence fellows that are entering the professional job market for the first time? Uh, I would say don't worry about the business so much. And this is probably something you disagree with. And maybe you could help them out uh, because look, you know, 
if you take care of the man across the table from you, he'll take care of you, okay? If you don't do great surgery, if you don't give him a good result, forget your money. The money will come. Don't worry about the money. Don't focus on the money. Money, money, money is a byproduct of you being a good doctor, a good surgeon with a good result. If you don't have that, you're not going to get anything. You're just going to look like a businessman trying to make a deal. So I, I never really worried about the money. I still don't. I just do a good job and it, it, you know, it flows. That's, that's so, but then you got to figure out what you're going to do with it. Uh, but, but I just, that wasn't my emphasis ever, you know, and look, I remember, I remember working 120 hours a week. I was on call every other night at the hospital for five years. And we, you know, that's 480 hours a week, a month. And we got paid like $2,100 a month. And that was like $2 an hour, right? So, you know, I came out of my residency, $2 an hour. And the first case I did, it took me about an hour and a half. They gave me $4,000. And I was like, you know, I was thinking, is this, is this real? I don't know if this is real or not. I, I couldn't get used to it for a while. So, you know, it just was never, there was never anything for me to worry about. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I came with a chip on my shoulder. I came from Mississippi, which is probably the poorest, most least educated state. I can put my diplomas on the wall against anybody and I can say, you know what, you guys, you beat me. <laughs> so I, I, you know, but I, my father was a prisoner of war in Vietnam and he never came back. I had no money. I was helping to pay my way through school and, and medical school and everything else. And um, uh, I had so many jobs. You know, I seriously lived in a 10 by 12 foot room with my mother and my sister for probably 13 years. And uh, I was a janitor at a hospital in Laurel, Mississippi, uh, going to a junior college in Ellisville. And I was going to be a, I was going to be an architect. I, I was great in school. I love, you know, creative, you know, I, I love that. So I was going to be an architect. And I was dating the head surgeon's daughter, who was a beautiful girl. And I think every good story involves a beautiful girl somehow, uh, at least it should. So I was dating her and her father, who was the head surgeon in that hospital, was so embarrassed that his daughter was dating a janitor that he actually came out in the middle of the hall one day and he said, put down your mop, Garth. I know you make good grades. Why don't you come in and watch me do surgery? And so I said, okay. So I gowned up, went in and watched him do surgery. And the very next day I said, I'm going to be a surgeon. And that's how I decided to become a surgeon. Uh, and I went and changed uh, my junior college uh, from architecture to, to, to pre-med. And I knew I wanted to be a surgeon after that. And so to this day, I don't care who, whoever wants to watch surgery, I want them to come in. Um, I have the patient, uh, you know, they know this and consent to it and they watch the surgery. And I've already had three conversions in the last year. Uh, I just, you know, I love to inspire people and, you know, having two kids, uh, two daughters that are amazing daughters, uh, you know, so much of our life is about exposure in every different way. Whether you're exposed to a new business, exposed to new friends, plastic surgery, exposed to new techniques, exposed to new ways of dealing with things. And, you just, have to, you just have to know that something's out there that you may not know about. Exposure is key. And hopefully you're getting exposed to the right guy, not the wrong guy. But uh, yeah. So with someone that's as busy as you, how could a interested chief resident or fellow that maybe wants to pick your brain and maybe get on a quick, you know, a 10, 15 minute Zoom call, is that something you'd be interested in? And if so, you know, how would you suggest that they reach out to you? Uh, they call my, my office and talk to Bonnie and just know that they're going to come in and have to pick up information during a hurricane. You know, it's like picking up paper with the wind blowing. You know, I'm going through and I'm going fast. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've really designed my own life. I like my life. And I, when I'm on, I'm on. When I'm off, I'm off. And, and, but but uh, they can always call and, and find a way to come in. I'm happy to help. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.